CataractCoach.com, curriculum lesson number 15. Time to learn about cortex removal using the irrigation aspiration. CataractCoach.com, and we're looking at bimanual irrigation aspiration, a very useful technique to access 360 degrees of the cortex to get underneath the anterior capsule rim. So here we're using the transformer IA handpiece. In the setting of an open capsule, the right hand holds the infusion, which goes through the normal phaco incision, either 2.2 or 2.4, 2.8 millimeters. And then the left hand, or the other hand, second hand, is going to hold the aspirator. So here, that aspirating device is going in with the left hand, and we can access the cortex and the subincisional area opposite that paracentesis. It is helpful if you have a second paracentesis, and if you have a second paracentesis that's on the opposite side, you'll get more access. It's a lot easier to access the full 360. Another benefit here, this is a case, again, with an open posterior capsule, which you can see there. It's very helpful in this case to have the infusion always in the eye. By keeping the anterior chamber fully inflated the entire time, not letting it collapse, we prevent vitreous prolapse. So believe it or not, in this case, with 50% of the posterior capsule open, there will not be vitreous prolapse. So now the infusion's gone and staying in the same hand, and the cortex now is being removed with the aspirator through the second paracentesis. So you can switch hands here if you'd like. You can keep the hands, just move your positioning of them. Either way is acceptable. Here's something different. This is an IV used to give an intravenous line. We got it from our circulating nurse. Retract and get rid of the needle. And then what remains is between a 22 and 24 gauge cannula for infusion. So that is going to be now our new infusion line. So we take out the aspirator from that transformer handpiece. And now we can unscrew this, take off the lure lock, and we can place our plastic IV tubing here. And again, we can match the size, 22 or 23 or 24 gauge. Now that's helpful to do bimanual irrigation aspiration. Many surgeons routinely do bimanual irrigation aspiration through two paracentesis incisions. And in that case, they have instruments, typically non-disposable instruments, that are used over and over again. In this situation, we didn't have that readily available. And we didn't want to use the main incision. We have a sulcus lens placed here, and we want to avoid having any kind of vitreous prolapse. So we want the anterior chamber to be maintained. So what we're able to do is use this cannula on the left hand to squirt around and keep the infusion, wash out any viscoelastic, and also prevent any kind of collapse of the anterior chamber. You'll notice that the main phaco incision is already sutured shut. Now we can hydrate and seal up the two pairs of these incisions as well as the main incision and finish the case. So a very important lesson here, and that is you have to be able to think on the fly. And if you don't have a bimanual irrigation aspiration set ready, readily available, it's okay to use things like a plastic IV tip in order to accomplish the same goals. Thanks for watching. CataractCoach.com, talking about reflux mode. What's that? This is a routine FACO case. We're going to speed through the initial parts of it. There's the incision. Here showing you the completion of the capsulorexis. And then we'll go on to the FACO mode and remove the nucleus as well. Reflux is when you get the pump on the machine to move backwards. Instead of aspirating fluid out of the eye, it puts fluid back in the eye. So it's helpful to release suction. Most commonly we use it during IA and cortex removal. And that's what I want to show you here. So we're moving cortex. Everything looks good. And when we inadvertently grab the capsule, watch carefully. There it is. Those radial lines on the posterior capsule tell me that we're inadvertently grabbing the posterior capsule. Very quickly with my foot pedal, I reflux it. And on my machine, that means kicking to the left. Different machines have different ways of engaging it, but all machines should have a reflux mode. It releases the vacuum and even more so temporarily spins the fluidic pump in the opposite direction to reflux fluid back inside the eye. So we don't often use the reflux mode. It's rarely used, but in times like this case, it's very useful. 
So you saw when I inadvertently grabbed the posterior capsule, we saw the radial wrinkles and striae in that posterior capsule. That's the time to quickly not only release the vacuum, but reflux it. And that allows the capsule to come out of the port, and then we can resume normally. So make sure you go to your machines and understand where, where is the reflux mode, how do you engage it, because sometimes you're going to need it. Not often, but there are cases like this one where reflux mode makes all the difference. Thank you for watching. We certainly appreciate it. CataractCoach.com. Checking for hidden cortex. Capsular bag looks clean, but look here under the iris. There's some hidden lens material. And post-op day one could look like this. So we need to prevent that from happening. Let me show you this case. It's a routine cataract case and a patient who takes Flomax or Tamsulosin. And that can lead to this smaller pupil, floppy iris syndrome, etc. So we did a nice capsulorexis, a little bit larger than the pupil. About a four and a half millimeter pupil now and about a five and a half millimeter rexis. We hydrodissect and bring this nucleus partially out of the capsular bag. Now it's less than halfway out of the capsular bag but that's sufficient to hold the nucleus in place. And also the nucleus itself holds the pupil open, holds the iris away and prevents that iris from coming near our phaco probe. So we solve the issue of the floppy iris as well. Now we'll put the phaco probe in the eye and we're gonna do a chop technique here. So here comes our chopper. We can buzz into the center of the nucleus, go around the equator and break off a piece. And there we go, we got there, a hemi-nucleus a little bit less than half of the size, and we can emulsify this just about at the iris plane. Now, fortunately, this is not too dense of a cataract, and this is going to be uh, emulsified relatively quickly. Once that piece is gone, we'll go into the second half, bring it partially up out of the capsule bag, and emulsify it as well. And you can see the nucleus is really doing a good job of staying stationary because the iris is holding it. And it's also keeping the pupil expanded. The nucleus is holding the pupil open and keeping the iris pushed back. So now we will attack that second half of the nucleus. Here it goes, coming up through the pupil. And it's very easy to stay centrally and work in this small little zone and not move the phaco probe too much. You see there's a paucity of movements. We stay right there in the center and we don't need to move around the eye so much. And once we emulsify all of the Remaining nuclear pieces, we can see the capsular bag looks great. So now just some cortex remaining. Again, the chopper's in the safety or protective position to make sure the capsular bag does not come forwards. Now the pupils become a little bit smaller, probably about four millimeters, maybe even three and a half millimeters at this point. But we can still proceed with the case normally. We don't need to use iris hooks or a pupil expansion ring. We can instead put the eye probe in the eye, a little bit of an expansion there from the infusion pressure, and now going under the iris to remove all the lens cortex. So we go in a circumferential manner. So we don't want to miss too many spots. We want to start in one direction, go around, and make sure we remove the cortex for 360 degrees. And this looks great, removing all of it. And you can tell, of course, from the introduction picture in this video that we're going to have a residual or hidden piece of cortex. I'm going to show that to you. So it looks like a totally clear and empty capsule bag, double checking all the areas. Everything looks pretty good here. Well, of course, we can't directly see behind the iris, so it's hard to tell for sure. So now what we can do is we can fill our capsule bag with our cohesive viscoelastic. And there we see a little bit of cortex hidden there in that one corner top left from your view at about the 11 o'clock position. And so we know we'll have to check there at the end. We'll put the lens in the capsule bag. Now sometimes putting the lens in the bag and then rotating it helps to stir up any attached lens material that's at the capsule bag equator. So there's delivering the eye well, making sure it goes completely in the capsule bag and the haptics unfold, and we can rotate this around. And now this is a good time to lift the iris and check there, there's all that lens cortex. And we can do this for 360 degrees. Use the chopper, lift it up, that looks good. We can ensure that there's no residual lens material, maybe a little bit on this side. Let's double check that again. Uh, tiny bit, not too bad. We can get that. We also can see that the eye well optic is completely behind our capsular axis. So now we know it's primarily that one spot. So let's put the IA probe back in the eye 
and remove the one little bit here, and then there's a larger piece that's gonna be under the iris here in the top left, about your 11 o'clock position. Now we can use the chopper here to help us, two-handed technique. Chopper lifting up the iris to give us a view, and then we can go under there. And there's that last residual piece also from the right, and now everything looks clean. We can use this chopper again to look around and make sure everything's good. Now let's go under the eyewall optic to remove the rest of the viscoelastic from the capsule bag. And then we can finish up the case here. Now you see the pupil has become even smaller. Now we're pretty much at about a three, maybe three and a half millimeter pupil. But still the case can proceed normally. And the big advantage you have here is you have a more efficient case, which is less traumatic. Notice there's no damage to the iris. Putting in iris hooks or putting in a capsular, I mean a pupil expansion ring, will damage the pupil margin for sure. But in this case, we've avoided that. So we'll hide it up our incisions. And then the last bit here, we can actually go in through the side port once the main incision is sealed and sweep around and inject just to make sure we don't have anything left. Going above the iris, also injecting under the iris just to make sure. And that looks great. Thank you for watching. CataractCoach.com. Finishing this case will be quite difficult. Here's why. You think you'll just get this last bit of cortex, right? Let me show you. So we'll speed up the case, do it nice and fast here. You can see we've placed marks on the limbus for a torque lens, anesthetic going inside the eye. Everything looks pretty good so far. Filling up the anterior chamber with our dispersive viscoelastic. Still looks good, very routine case. Patient's a little hyperopic with a lot of astigmatism. Placing our phaco incision there on the steep axis. You can see those three dots in the cornea show our steep axis. Creating the capsule axis. You know what? The capsule looks good. Nice and tight. No evidence of loose zonules. So we create a nice round capsule axis. We're looking good. So where's the challenge going to be? Why is this going to be so difficult and challenging? A little bit of hydrodissection. I'll see a few fluid waves going across. That looks good. There's our nucleus. It prolapses partially out of the bag. Hey, we'll take it. No big deal. More dispersive viscoelastic to protect the cornea. Faco probe going in the eye. We're going to use our chopper. We're going to chop, chop, chop this nucleus. So probe there. Nucleus is chopped in half. Each half is then emulsified. So you're still wondering, okay, where's the challenge? Now, part of the challenge, the minor part of the challenge is that it's a very high-profile patient in our practice, and it's a very important um, patient for us to get a beautiful outcome. The challenge is the patient hasn't told you, and you find out only afterwards that the patient was in an accident where he got hit in the eye, and the patient has sustained a little bit of zonular loss. Now, not much. In fact, when we created the caps rex, it was totally normal. So let's watch now during cortex removal. So nucleus is out, that one very efficient. We're showing you the whole case. Nothing hidden from you. Nice and easy on the cortex removal, but what do I notice? As we remove the cortex, the AC seems shallow. The posterior capsule keeps coming forwards. So it's really difficult to access everything. The capsule bag has collapsed, why? We have a lot of infusion pressure, but some of the fluid is going through the area of zonular breakage and into the anterior hyaloid face. So now it's collecting some fluid in the anterior hyaloid face. And that little bit of sub-incisional cortex is tough to get out because when we put the phaco IA probe down that area, we end up getting just more infusion going into the anterior hyaloid face. So here comes the eye well. Again, the bag is shallow. So it's very difficult to kind of get this thing dialed in where we want it. So we finally get it into position. And now we can go in and remove the rest of that cortex piece and the viscoelastic from behind the eye well. Now we still have to do our normal techniques of removing viscoelastic from behind the eye well because... It's a torque lens, we don't want it to rotate. So we still have that persistent area where there's that sub-incisional cortex. I try to get it out here manually using a cannula, 27 gauge cannula on a 3cc syringe. That helped to loosen it up. And we'll try a little bit more. 
So what are the other options? Well, you could do a Parge Plana stab and try to get out some of the fluid that's accumulated in the anterior hyaloid face. That's one option. You can also do what I did here, which is just increase the infusion pressure and hope that most of that infusion pressure is going to just deepen the AC instead of going behind and causing more fluid to accumulate in the anterior hyaloid face. So again, we're still having a challenge here. Look how shallow the anterior chamber is. Now the fluid that's left in the anterior hyaloid phase, it'll equilibrate and absorb and be gone within a day or so. So that's no issue of leaving it there. But I don't want to leave the case like this. I don't want to leave the patient with this IOL not in the appropriate position, etc. So now we're going to do a bimanual approach. Get that last bit of cortex out. Don't leave it behind in the eye. Now it's cleaned up. And we still have a nice overlap of the rexus. That looks beautiful. Let's dial in the eye well to the appropriate axis. Again, not easy. So try again. Infusion going in the eye here. And it's tough because the AC is so shallow. But we're just going to nudge the lens around. So this is why it's so important to ask the patients ahead of time, have you ever had any trauma to your eyes? Then you can know to expect a challenge like this. So fortunately for us, everything goes beautifully. We finished the case. Everything turned out nice. The patient had a beautiful outcome, was super happy. And we did find out in the post-op period that, yes, he did have that injury that he neglected to tell us about. Here's a little triamcinone going in the eye, helps with inflammation control, plus we can also make sure that there is no vitreous prolapse through that weak area. A little bit of wrinkle in the capsule also indicates that there's some xylo laxity now. So a beautiful case that ended well. Boy, it was a challenge for me. Check out cataractcoach.com, our teaching website. You can learn a lot, way more material than you have here on YouTube. I dare you, check it out. Cataractcoach.com, sub-incisional cortex removal. So you can use the IOL to help loosen it and protect the posterior capsule. We're going to show you a complete cataract case. This is this surgeon's 600th cataract case. So it's a good benchmark for you to see. If you've done about five or 600 cases, you should be at about this level. And you can use this as a guide to figure out what you could do better. So this total case is about eight and a half minutes, and this surgeon does a very good job with that. You can see nice good red reflex there. Good draping, by the way. Lid margin sequestered, no lash in the field. Let's see the incision. A little bit of a groove made here. And that's a really nice looking incision. I'll take it. Barely nicking the limbal vessels. Very nice. Let's see the Rex is going over the cystotome. Cutting across. And let's see getting that flap pushed over. Looks like going, by, uh, going in the clockwise direction. And now switching over to some caps Rexus forceps. And continuing that Rexus. Nice pivoting technique. So obviously this surgeon has learned a lot. Again, case 600 is pretty good. That looks really nice, good rexus, bringing that around nice and easy. I like the pivoting, the rexus is pretty round. Notice how it's being grabbed in the safe zones and in the danger zones, it's just continued and not re-grabbed. That's a nice looking rexus, I'll take it. Here comes the hydro dissection. So again, this is an unedited routine case and this is this surgeon's 600th case or thereabouts. So tapping the center of the nucleus, a little bit of hydrodissection done. Let's see, do you want to spin the nucleus? There you go. You know the cataract coach saying, come on, stay with me. If it does not spin, you will not win. But this one's spinning, so it looks like you're going to win this one. Good job. So there's the nucleus, and it's nicely hydrodissected. And then now let's see what the phaco technique is going to be. What are you guys thinking? You think it's going to be a chop? A stop and chop? A divide and conquer? Uh, 600 cases I'm going with stop and chop. Let's find out. I haven't watched the video before. I'm watching it for the first time with you. So let's see. We go in here. Faco probe. And buzzing it in. Oh, I was wrong. Going right for the chop very nicely. I like it. Horizontal chop nicely done, young surgeon. This surgeon, he or she is doing a fantastic job. So right to the horizontal. If you're doing a nice horizontal chop like this after 600 cases, you are doing great. That looks fantastic. 
Good job. Put that right hand down, get that eye back in primary. Let's emulsify the pieces. Very nicely done. So most surgeons, I think, at about this level would still stick with stop and chop. A little bit easier. The, the, the horizontal chop like this is a little bit more technical. But obviously, this surgeon has mastered it and done a very good job. I'm very pleased. Very impressed. There's the other hemonucleus left. Let's see buzzing of the probe. Chopper going around the equator. Cleanly done. Very nice technique. Young Jedi, you are doing very well. So now removing that little last quadrant here. And let's see any further sub chops. Probably not needed. Emulsify that down. Eye staying pretty much in primary. Good job there. Taking that last little bit of nucleus out. All righty, time for the IA probe. Very, very nicely done. I am impressed. Now, cortex removal, IA probe coming up. And you saw from the title slide, this is a case where the subincisional cortex is a little bit tougher to remove. Now, in the U.S., the most common way is doing this style, which is a coaxial irrigation aspiration to remove the cortex. In other places, like in Europe, you'll, you'll find that the bimanual approach with two pairs and TCs is far more common. And arguably that does give a little bit more access. And you also can switch hands and get that subincisional area maybe a little bit better. We have shown videos of even the coaxial system that can be taken apart, the transformer IA handpiece, which you can then turn into an instant kind of bimanual approach where the aspirator goes in through your pairs and TCs to access that subincisional area. And that works too. But in this case, I like that this surgeon is doing something a little different. And here's what's going on. So the cortex is mostly removed. It's just that subincisional area. Now, I find that it's easy here at this point to get the eye out of primary. I know I keep telling you the whole case to keep the eye in primary, but here's the one case where I'll get it out of primary, and that's to get the eye moving temporally here or towards the subincisional area so I can access that one area. And this surgeon is going to have a harder time doing this, and he or she is going to do an alternative technique. So that subincisional cortex is a little bit tough time coming out. That's okay. The rest of the stuff has been removed pretty easily. So a couple options here. Yes, okay, you don't have a bimanual setup. You don't have a transform eye handpiece. What else can you do? You can come out of the eye and inject the viscoelastic through the paracentesis and use the OVD to loosen up all that subincisional cortex. Or you can do what this case is going to be. You can just fill the capsule bag of viscoelastic, get the IOL in, and have that IOL rotated around so the IOL itself will loosen up that subincisional cortex. But do not leave the subincisional cortex like this inside the eye. You can't do that. If you leave it in there, this little bit of cortex will swell up to many times its normal size and be this big, fluffy, white, cotton ball stuff right in your visual access the next morning. So don't do that. So make sure you get it out. So in this case, yeah, here you go. The single piece acrylic lens is going to go in. Looks like an automated injector. I like that. Looking good. Let's get that inside the eye. And then you can use that IOL and kind of dial it around in the bag and use that to loosen up the subincisional cortex. So here comes the lens going in the capsule bag very nicely. And as that lens goes in, you can loosen up the subincisional cortex with it, plus the lens itself will keep the posterior capsule away. So when you're doing the final cortex removal, you don't have to worry about that posterior capsule coming into your port. Now, I like that the surgeon rotated the lens away so the haptics are not pushing that subincisional cortex back into the capsule bag equator. That's important. So now you can just go with the IA probe and don't waste any time. Go right for that subincisional cortex. Don't worry about the viscoelastic right now. Go right for the subincisional cortex and you'll be able to grab it and pull it out and look how the IOL optic gives you some room and the IOL optic keeps the posterior capsule away. So now you can fully access that subincisional space. Okay to get the eye out of primary position here. Get a good grab of that subincisional cortex. You don't quite have, there you go. You're almost there. Don't give up now. Come on. There it is. And now once it's removed, get the lens back into center position. Let's finish up this case. And you can see it was a nice incision, nice rexus. This is a dang nice case. So young doctor, 
You have done a beautiful job, and I commend you for that, and I'm glad you sent the video in. For case number 600, you are doing great. I anticipate you're going to be a world-class surgeon in just a couple thousand more cases. So beautifully done here, and now you also know how to easily get that sub-incisional cortex. Thanks for watching. CataractCoach.com That's not cortex being aspirated. So when should a capsular tension ring be placed for zonular dialysis? Our guest surgeon here is Dr. Amar Kalkarni from India. And let me show you the cleanup of the cortex. So that looks okay. And then trying to get more of the cortex. Watch carefully. Ooh, those linear lines, that's zonular dialysis right there. That's the capsule being pulled. So you don't want to do that. So you can reinflate it with viscoelastic here. But you've got to be super cautious. That's the area right there. And so all surgeons have had this issue where you go to clean up some of the cortex and the capsorexis edge moves and the, you see all those linear wrinkles of the capsule. And that's not what we want. So viscoelastic's your friend here to reinflate the capsular bag. This looks like HPMC, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose. You can still try to clean up some of the cortex now or you can put the CTR in. That CTR, the capsular tension ring, the catch is if you put it in, it can also trap some of this cortex in the capsular bag at the equator. Because when I think about it, that outward force of the CTR is gonna push this cortex out towards the, the lens equator or lens periphery. So do the cleanup here on the areas that have better support and then that one area, which is the inferior part of your video screen, that area maybe we can leave a little bit and come back and do it after we get the CTR. But be very cautious, pulling too much in that area. See that, oh, you're put, there's the loose capsule again. You also don't want to come out of the eye and let the eye collapse. If you come out of the eye and the eye collapses like that, you may get vitreous prolapse. Look at that big zonal dialysis there. Yeah, so you can get vitreous prolapse. So you need to make sure that anterior hyaloid face stays intact. So again, lots and lots of viscoelastic. This is a stressful case. You got to keep calm under pressure when you're doing this. Dr. Kolkarni is doing a really good job here. Staying calm. Look, plenty of viscoelastic, remember? Who told you viscoelastic is cheaper than vitreous? If you need more, you need more. Use it. So taking out that last bit of cortex. So you can also decrease the fluidic settings here on your cortex removal. So decrease the inflow, decrease the outflow so you don't remove so much of that viscoelastic because you want it there. Oh, pop, 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 I'd let go of that. I would let go of that, my friend. Let's leave that be. And then come out with the aspirator, but leave the infusion in. Don't take them both out. Oh, no, I'd leave them both in and then put viscoelastic in. So here's the viscoelastic. Definitely needs a capture tension ring. Now, fortunately, I think this is only a few clock hours of zionular dehiscence. So maybe three, maybe four clock hours. A CTR alone should be sufficient. Once you get to six clock hours or so, you may have to use a sutured CTR or capsule tension segment or some other technique. But I think in this case, you should be able to put the CTR in without too much issue here. So was this traumatic from ahead of time or was it iatrogenic traumatic? Hard to say, but either way, we know what we need to do. So we need to put in more viscoelastic and let's find that CTR here. And so CTR is coming. And again, you can put it in manually as we showed you last week, or you can put it in with an injector. Either one is okay. Let's see what we're going to do in this case. So again, more and more viscoelastic. You may want to also tell your staff to get the triamcinolone out. So when you're done with this case, put some triamcinolone there just to make sure you don't have any vitreous prolapse. If you do, you may need to do a little bit of an anterior vitrectomy as well. But the only way to really tell is to use that triamcinolone to get a good stain of any prolapsed vitreous. It'll also obviously help with post-op inflammation here. So now more and more viscoelastic. Okay, let's get that CTR. Come on, people. We want that. That CTR, now here it is. So being placed manually, again, I like the position here. So starting off away from that area and going in tangentially, following the curve here of the eye of the capsule bag. So that CTR is going to be placed quite gently. Okay, going the other way. Either way is okay. Get that in the capsule bag, nice and gently. Advance it in, as a nice, in a controlled manner. And you can see the little eyelets on the end of it. Those eyelets can be helpful to use a Sinsky hook or other small instrument to hold them to get it delivered. So you can even use a two-handed technique by the um, feeding hand over hand like he's doing here, or you can just one-handed. 
And as that's advanced in, that trailing haptic can then be, uh, trailing arm can be grabbed here with just that uh, Sinsky hook. There's that Sinsky hook. And that can be placed here inside the eye. And this pair is big enough to get the forcep tips in there. And now it can be gently placed in the capsule bag. Now that's going to provide sufficient support. And you notice the rexus kind of goes back to its original shape. And there's the lens in the bag. And all is well that ends well. And this patient had a nice outcome. A little bit of wrinkle in the capsule bag. That's okay. Thanks for watching.